Lecture 5 Alternative Theories of Mind Last lecture, we considered token identity theory and functionalism. Ultimately, the suggestion was that instances of mental states are identical to particular instances of brain states, brain states that function in particular ways. A brain state that causes you to avoid physical damage to your body is identical to a mental state of pain. But the theory is problematic in that it seems impossible for mental states to be identical to brain states since each has properties that the other lacks. Yet, the facts of science cannot be ignored. We know that our behavior is dictated by the structure of our brain. The way our neurons are wired and fired determines our behavior. So, taking certain advancements in science as a model, some philosophers have suggested that the reason the philosophical questions about the mind that we have been considering are so elusive is because they are bad questions to begin with. Why? Because, they suggest, minds don't exist. They're fictions. All that exists are brains, and that is all that needs to be accounted for. I always hear that line from Ghostbusters when I think of eliminative materialism. There is no Dana, only Zool. I always envision Patricia Churchland, one of the most famous philosophers to defend this position, saying something similar. There is no mind, only brain. Philosophers such as Churchland are called eliminative materialists, and they think philosophy of mind is headed where medical science once was. Think of it this way. When people used to get sick, the favorite explanation was demon possession. Without a scientific understanding of the way the world works, that was the best explanation that people could give. But when we learn that illness and disease is actually caused by germs and bacteria, we did not continue to believe in the existence of demons. Certainly no one said, oh no, demons really do exist, it's just that they're identical to germs and bacteria. That's just what demons are. Such a suggestion would obviously have been a desperate attempt to save talk of demons from being eliminated from our vocabulary. But in reality, medical advancements eliminated all reasons for thinking that demons exist. We no longer need them to explain disease, and so they were eliminated from our ontology, our, our list of things that exist. Eliminative materialists suggest the same thing should happen with the mind. We no longer need to hypothesize the existence of minds to account for human behavior. Explanations for why we do what we do can now be had solely by referring to the activity of our brains. And so, just as we eliminated demons from our ontology, once they were no longer needed to explain anything, so too should we eliminate minds. So, we should also no longer talk as if minds exist and as if they causally affect the world. We should no longer think that people do things because they have certain beliefs, desires, or experiences. Eliminative materialists call such talk folk psychology, and they think it should be eliminated. I don't go to Johnny Rockets to get sweet potato fries because I experience a mental craving for sweet potato fries. I go solely because certain sweet potato craving chemicals are released in my brain because of the way that Johnny Rocket sweet potato fries have made certain neurons fire in my brain in the past. Embracing eliminative materialism has a lot of philosophical advantages. First of all, it is quite simple. The fewer assumptions that a theory makes, the fewer number of entities it requires to be true, the simpler it is. Since eliminative materialism eliminates the mind, and all other theories suggest minds exist, eliminative materialism is simpler. And simplicity is a virtue in both science and philosophy. Eliminative materialism also explains quite nicely why all the other theories of mind, including those that we have yet to consider, are subject to so many convincing objections. The reason is that we've been barking up the wrong tree. These theories have been trying to explain minds when minds don't exist in the first place. Eliminative materialism even eliminates the hard problem of consciousness, which, recall, wonders how it is that brains give rise to mental activity. If there is no mental activity, 
there's nothing to account for. In addition, because it eliminates mind, eliminative materialism does not suffer from any of the problems that have plagued the other theories that we have considered so far. There is no problem of downwards causation, which troubled the soul hypothesis. If minds don't exist, they need not downwardly cause anything. There is also no problem of qualia, which recall haunted identity theory. In fact, we can even use these facts to construct an argument for eliminative materialism. So here's how the argument would go. Premise one of the argument. Minds aren't separate substances like the soul hypothesis suggests. The problems with the soul hypothesis seem to suggest exactly this. Premise two. It's also the case that minds can't be identical to brains, like identity theory suggests. Eliminative materialists point to the problem of qualia here. Specifically, they often point to the linguistic structure of beliefs and point out that no part of the brain has such a structure. Beliefs can't be identical to brain events, they argue. But if the mind exists, it would seem to have to either be something that exists separately from the brain or something that is identical to the brain itself. Since it obviously is neither, they argue, minds must not exist. The fact that other folk enterprises like folk medicine have failed is also reason for thinking that folk psychology is flawed and will eventually be eliminated. Eliminative materialists enjoy pointing out that folk psychology has yet to explain why we sleep and is not exactly a robust theory that lays the groundwork for fertile, fruitful research. On the other hand, neuroscience, the science that explains our behavior solely in terms of brain activity, is. Of course, a number of objections have been leveled against eliminative materialism. Some are more successful than others. Some claim eliminative materialism is self-refuting. It would seem to be a hard thing to believe since it suggests that minds don't exist and thus that beliefs don't exist. But eliminative materialists are quick to point out that the theory itself is not self-contradictory. Perhaps someone who says that they believe that there are no beliefs contradicts themselves, but one hardly needs to do this to be an eliminative materialist. After all, the assumption that the word belief refers to anything, or should even be used in the first place, is something that the eliminative materialists will deny. However, this objection may at least have the merit of pointing out that eliminative materialists would be better served by avoiding the suggestion that folk psychology should be eliminated. Even if folk psychology refers to nothing, folk psychology does seem to have its uses. Saying, I am in pain, is much easier than saying, my C fibers are firing in my prefrontal cortex. Preserving our way of talking about minds makes the suggestion that we have no minds an easier pill to swallow. But ultimately, the most obvious and successful objection to eliminative materialism is this. The existence of the mind seems to be undeniable to most people. Eliminative materialists are literally suggesting that you have no mind. So you are not having experiences right now. You are not hearing anything. You are not seeing anything. You are not thinking. You don't believe anything. All that is happening are events in your brain. This seems obviously false. After all, it's not like eliminative materialists are denying the existence of demons, hypothetical entities that we merely supposed existed without any direct awareness of them. No, eliminative materialists are denying the existence of something that we seem to have direct awareness of, our minds. In fact, Many philosophers have argued that the only thing that a person actually does know for sure is that they have a mind, that they are having experiences. You may be dreaming right now, but even if you are, you're experiencing that dream. You may be trapped in a computer simulation and the world may not be real, but you are still experiencing what the computer simulation is feeding you. In a few lectures, we will even consider arguments that suggest that persons don't exist as discrete entities. But even if you are not a person, your experiences still exist. Introspection seems to reveal the existence of minds with more certainty than anything else. So even though eliminative materialism is great as philosophical theories go, it's nice and simple, it avoids the objections that plague the other theories, Eliminative materialism is one of the most unintuitive theories that exists in all of philosophy.
The eliminativist will point out that our intuitions and even our introspection are not always reliable. In fact, they're often led astray. For example, people will often think they are in love when they're not, and that they believe things that they actually don't believe. For example, some people say they don't believe in luck or aren't superstitious, but they carry good luck charms. And in a few more lectures, we are going to talk about how even though our introspection seems to reveal that we have free will, philosophical investigation into the topic may reveal that it is merely an illusion. Eliminative materialists suggest that the existence of mind may be like this as well. Nothing more than what philosopher William Ramsey in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy calls a remnant of misguided Cartesian intuitions. But regardless of how often introspection leads us astray, many philosophers simply find eliminative materialism too hard of a pill to swallow. They can't deny that their own mind exists. If you're like them, don't fear, there are more alternatives. For example, we might turn to a theory called property dualism. Property dualists, recognizing the problems faced by the sole hypothesis and the suggestion that minds are made up of a separate substance, suggest instead that minds are made up of a different kind of property. They believe that there is only one kind of substance, matter, the material that makes up the physical world. But they think that substance has two different kinds of properties. Physical properties, such as location and mass and charge, and mental properties, the qualia we have been talking about. Properties such as the aboutness that a belief has, the intentionality that a decision has, uh, and the redness that a visual sensation has. The mind consists of the collection of these properties. A few property dualists, called panpsychists, think that all material in the universe has some degree of mentality. Even atoms have mental properties to some degree. But most suggest that it is only when a brain becomes sufficiently complex that such mental properties exist. It's important to realize, however, what the property dualists suggest these properties are. They are emergent, non-reductive properties. Now, what does that mean? Well, an emergent property is a property that is had by a whole that is not had by its parts. For example, think again about the heaviness of a car. Being heavy is not a property that the individual atoms of the car possess, but it is a property of the car itself. Heaviness is an emergent property. A reductive property is a property had by a whole that can be explained in virtue of the properties of its parts. For example, you can explain the heaviness of a car by referring to the mass of its individual atoms. Another example, even though an individual molecule of water is not wet, you can explain the wetness of a puddle of water in virtue of the properties and interactions of its individual molecules. Property dualists suggest that you cannot explain mental properties in this way. They are non-reductive. So the existence and powers of mental properties cannot be explained in terms of or with reference to physical brain events. Their existence is dependent upon brain events because they are a property of physical matter that makes up the brain, but mental properties are not reducible. It is also important to note that property dualists believe that these mental properties have causal efficacy. They make events happen in the physical brain that ultimately affect how our bodies behave that would not happen if they did not exist. In this way, property dualists are able to preserve the intuition that the mind has causal efficacy. A mental property of hunger emerges from my brain activity, altering the way that my neurons fire, and ultimately causes me to seek out my desired food. So we can still truthfully say that it is because I am hungry for sweet potato fries that I go to Johnny Rockets. Of course, the hard problem of consciousness is still left unanswered. One wonders why non-reducible mental properties emerge from sufficiently complex brain structures. The property dualists actually have an answer to this question, at least an answer of sorts. They suggest that we hypothesize a fundamental law to account for why this occurs. That it occurs is simply, they would say, a brute fact of the universe, a fact that just is true for no other reason than it simply is true. Now, you may not find that satisfactory, 
But recall from the first lecture that such an explanation is not that much different than explanations given by science. Recall how the names dark matter and dark energy stood in for explanations that we don't yet have. Consider the fact that we have no explanation for why the fundamental constants of physics have the values they do. Why does the charge to mass ratio of the electron have the value it does? It just does. Property dualists hypothesizing a law to explain how mental activity emerges from brain activity is not that much different. Our introspection, plus our scientific investigations into the way the brain works, has revealed that this indeed does occur. Sufficiently complex brain events give rise to mental events. But we don't know why, and so we invent a law that says this necessarily occurs. In a sense, property dualists are simply hypothesizing a fundamental constant. Get it? Fundamental? And eh, never mind. Property dualism does avoid many objections that plague other theories. For one, it doesn't deny the mind exists like eliminative materialism does. Also, since it doesn't suggest that minds are identical to brains, but maintains that physical and mental properties are different, it does not need to account for how they can be identical, yet have different properties. It also has numerous advantages. It doesn't contradict neuroscience, like the soul hypothesis, because it admits that the mind is dependent upon the brain. It also preserves the notion that minds have causal efficacy, that they actually have an effect on the world. But, of course, property dualism is also subject to numerous objections. First of all, how satisfied you are with property dualism will be somewhat dependent upon how satisfied you are in deferring to brute facts and fundamental laws as explanations. If you didn't like that to begin with, you're probably not impressed with property dualism. At least, you won't be impressed with its solution to the hard problem of consciousness. What's more, in all other cases, fundamental laws that account for properties apply fundamentally throughout the universe. All particles have charge. All particles have mass. So it seems odd for the property dualist to propose a fundamental law that only accounts for special circumstances that come into play only when brain patterns are sufficiently complex. This would be quite a unique fundamental law. Making the hypothesis that such a law exists seems a little ad hoc, kind of, kind of like an excuse. Another similar problem is brought up by the idea of mental properties being emergent yet non-reductive. It seems that a non-reductive emergent property would be unique in the universe. All properties that in the past have seemed to be non-reductive, such as the wetness of water, were eventually discovered to be reductive. They were explained in virtue of their parts. It would be nice if the property dualist had an example of a non-reductive emergent property so that we knew the existence of such things is even possible. But without that, the existence of the mind as a non-reductive emergent property is problematic. The uniqueness of such a property is a major downfall for the theory. In addition, it's questionable whether property dualism is really any better off than substance dualism, that is, the sole hypothesis. Substance dualism was plagued by the question of how a non-material substance could interact and cause things to occur in a physical substance. Not only does it seem that there is no explanation for how such a thing could occur, but such a thing occurring would violate basic laws of the universe. The same questions arise about how a non-physical property could causally affect physical properties or physical events. Some property dualists insist that non-physical properties wouldn't necessarily violate the physical laws. For example, they need not add energy to the system of the brain, but could merely redirect that energy. However, it's far from clear whether or not this is really a legitimate explanation. After all, there are no other instances of energy redirection accomplished by anything else other than a physical entity or a physical property. It's unclear that energy can be redirected without requiring some kind of energy transference. One suspects that this may be an untestable excuse to save the theory from the objection. But regardless, the problems property dualism has accounting for mental causation can be avoided by embracing a somewhat similar theory called epiphenomenalism. 
Epiphenomenalism suggests that the mind does emerge from brain activity just like property dualism. In fact, the best candidate for the kind of brain events that mental phenomena emerge from are those that function the way that functionalism suggests. So epiphenomenalism is compatible with many other theories. But epiphenomenalists suggest the mind doesn't do anything. It has no causal powers. Minds are what some philosophers have dubbed causal danglers. Things that exist, but don't have any effect on the way the world goes or what bodies do. Epiphenomenalism has many of the same advantages as property dualism. It doesn't deny the existence of minds, it can account for qualia, and it coheres with what neuroscience has demonstrated is true. The mind's existence is directly dependent upon the existence of the brain. It also avoids all the objections that are leveled against the other non-materialist theories. Since it suggests that minds have no causal powers, it need not account for downwards causation, or explain away how mental efficacy violates known physical laws. It seems to have all the advantages of both the materialist theories and the non-materialist theories. But of course, there is one big obvious exception. It denies that minds have causal powers. The intuitive force of the notion that minds have causal powers is very strong. It seems quite clear that when I get up and go to Johnny Rockets for sweet potato fries, my hunger for sweet potato fries plays a direct causal role in producing my action. I get in my car and drive away because I am hungry. Man, Johnny Rockets should be paying me ad money. That's crazy. Let, let's use another example. Uh, my love for my wife makes me kiss her on the cheek. My desire to do philosophy made me choose my career. It seems to be a fact that my mental events have a direct causal effect on the way I behave. And if they do, epiphenomenalism can't be true. The epiphenomenalist will insist that seeming fact is an illusion, one propagated by logically fallacious thinking. Specifically, they will say that the intuition that mental events cause our behavior invokes the causal fallacy. The causal fallacy comes in many different varieties, but the most well-known one fallaciously reasons that correlation necessarily entails causation. It does not. The fact that two events are correlated does not mean that one causes the other. The correlation may be a coincidence or the result of them both being caused by some third event and not directly causally related themselves. A classic example is this. There is a direct correlation between shoe size and reading ability. The smaller someone's shoe size, the less likely it is that they can read. The larger their shoe size, the more likely it is that they can read. But it does not follow from this that shoe size causes one to have the ability to read. They are related to a third factor that causes them both, age. Being older makes one more likely to have a larger shoe size and more likely to be able to read. To conclude that one thing causes the other simply because one is correlated with the other is logically fallacious. Epiphenomenalists suggest the same thing about mental events and human behavior. It may seem that mental events cause human behavior because they are closely correlated. Being hungry for sweet potato fries is always correlated with me going to Johnny Rockets. But it does not follow from this that one causes the other. It may be that they are correlated simply because they are both caused by a common third event. And in fact, this is exactly what the epiphenomenalists suggest. My hunger for sweet potato fries and my going to Johnny Rockets are both caused by a common third event, a brain event. The release of sweet potato fry craving chemicals in my brain caused me to get in my car and drive away, but also give rise to a mental event of hunger. Lastly, as we shall see a bit later, some research in neuroscience suggests that unconscious parts of the brain do our decision-making for us long before the conscious parts of the brain, our conscious act of decision-making, even takes place. If this is right, this gives strong support to the idea that mental events don't actually play a causal role in bringing about our behavior, just like the epiphenomenalist suggests. But still, the idea that mental events are not causally efficacious may be too hard for you to swallow. After all, something that exists but doesn't do anything would be a unique phenomenon indeed. If that's the case, you are not alone. Many philosophers don't like epiphenomenalism for just this very reason. But we are now at the end of our list of theories in philosophy of mind. So if you don't like this one, you're going to have to go back and choose another. 
The sole hypothesis, identity theory, functionalism, eliminative materialism, property dualism. You will have to figure out which theory's unintuitive consequences you are willing to accept. Unless, of course, you are content with simply saying, I don't know. Recall that in the first lecture, I told you that metaphysics doesn't always provide an answer. It explores many answers and points out the problems with each. It is possible to embrace one of those answers. Metaphysics just shows you what consequences you will have to accept if you do. But it's also possible to be satisfied with the understanding that metaphysics gives you. The understanding that you should now possess about each theory and the problems each one faces. The understanding of how difficult these questions we have been considering are to answer. Recall, Socrates was considered by the Oracle at Delphi to be the wisest because he admitted that he did not have knowledge. This may be one of those times when admitting a lack of knowledge is a true indication of wisdom. What exactly is the mind? And what is the relationship between the mind and brain? How is it that neural activity gives rise to mental activity? These are important metaphysical questions, questions about the very nature of reality, the very nature of us. But we simply may not know.